Good morning again and welcome to the NCCAT Single Particle Short Course. What we are, I guess this will date the short course, what we're living through is the coronavirus and what we don't want to do is create hysteria. We want you to be healthy, we want you to be safe. Fortunately, what we've been able to do, despite our speakers not being able to come here, is keep on pursuing sharing of information, sharing of knowledge, and keeping science going. Okay, so our speakers today are Damien Eckert and Gary Baba, and they're going to talk about model refinement and validation. So you just heard Ollie speak a little bit about now we have an EMAP, now we're fixing scaling, and now we're building an atomic model. How do we know that model is correct? How do we validate that? What other hypotheses can we extend from that, given that we have a mixed resolution map? And this is becoming more and more relevant because we're trying to get standards into the field. So Damien and Gare are hailing from New York University, where they are using a plethora of techniques, including biology, biochemistry, extra crystallography, and cryo-EM. And the reason why all these modalities are important is because structural biology is a great tool, but what we really want to do is answer biological questions. And what's topical, some of their research is not on just trafficking, um, but they also deal with pathogens as well. So without further ado, Damien Gira. Uh, thanks, Ed, for that, that introduction. Um, and so hopefully everyone can hear me. And uh, so if you have any questions along the way, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, so far, I, can, I, I think I can hear the room OK, but um, shout loudly if, if I don't seem to be responding and I just keep talking. Um, yeah, so let's, let's jump right in. So can you all see my cursor? Yes. Yes, OK, cool. All right. So let's, there we go, all right. So, um, so uh, I'll focus on kind of two main topics during during my talk today. And so, um, so first we'll talk about refinement. So once you've you've built that beautiful model, uh, now that you'll be experts in Coot after uh, Ali's tutorial, um, you know. So, so usually we'll take that model and then put it into some refinement software. Um, and and then so we'll talk a bit about refinement first. And then in this in the second part of my talk. Um, We'll talk a bit about validating the model that we ultimately get out of this process of, of kind of manual model building in Coot and, and then refinement in these, these refinement packages. Okay, so so what are the goals of, of doing refinement? You know, so why can't we just stop with, with the model that we've built in Coot? Um, and so so the problem is we can, you know, Coot is pretty powerful and, and we can make a lot of adjustments to the model. Um, but we tend to not be as precise as, as we would probably like to be. Um, you know, particularly at the junctions of regions that we've modified, um, there may be some distortions, and it, it's really kind of time-consuming and painstaking to try to make the model absolutely perfect by hand. Um, and so, so refinement software kind of helps helps in this process. And so, so ultimately, our goal is to to kind of try to create a set of coordinates that, as best as possible, explains the the data we observed. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that, that that model we create conforms with what we already know and expect about proteins in general. And so, so the refinement software will hopefully help us to get there. And so um, I think that there's lots of parallels in, in how you can think about the refinement process, parallels between refinement and, and sort of what you may have heard of in kind of your freshman biochemistry class about sort of protein folding and this kind of energy landscape of proteins. And so, uh, so for protein folding, we know that the protein starts in a kind of high energy unfolded state and samples a, a very large number of different conformations of different energies. Uh, but the goal in protein folding is to take that unfolded protein through a series of intermediate states and hopefully try to find the global uh, low energy folded state of the protein. And so here, uh, you know, this, this kind of folding funnel, so the positions along the funnel represent uh, uh, individual conformations of the protein. Um, and then the, the kind of vertical axis here corresponds to some sort of energy, so often sort of the, the free energy of folding. And so as we move down the funnel, we move to, to lower and lower energy states of protein. And so um, this is conceptually very similar to the refinement process. So actually, hang on, I'm hitting the wrong keyboard here. Um, okay, so so we can we can kind of replace this energy term in the vertical axis here with with some sort of function that describes 
how well our protein uh, agrees with, with the observed data. Okay. And so we call this a refinement target function. So it's essentially just a scoring function that tells us how well our current model at this stage for refinement agrees, agrees with the, uh, the observed experimental data. And so up here at the top, when the target function is very large, that says that our model doesn't agree very well with the observed data. And down here at the bottom, when, the, when we've minimized that, that refinement target, um, that says our model agrees uh, very well with, with the observed experimental data. Um, so on here in the right, um, again, you can kind of think of the positions along this, this funnel as, as different conformations of the protein, perhaps not quite so dramatic as going from the completely unfolded state to a folded state, uh, but different positions of secondary structural elements, different side chain rotamers, different uh, ways to parameterize uh, E factors, for example. Okay, and so, so the goal is to now try to, to find the conformation of our protein um, that, that best explains the observed data. Okay, and so, so what is this refinement target function that, um, that we're going to try to optimize our model against? So in the simplest case, um, you can imagine we, we have our map from our experiment. So, um, uh, so this is our, our, uh, our EM density map. Um, and from the model that we've built so far, um, we can calculate what the expected density map would be based on this model. Okay, so, so now we potentially have, have two maps, one that's actually experimentally derived, one that we've calculated from our model, and we can just compare these. And so, so in the simplest case, this could be um, our refinement target function, right? So we just compare our calculated map from the model with our observed map from the experiment quantify these differences in some way and, and try to adjust our model such that it better agrees with, with our map. And so um, just sort of when we're working in this kind of map versus map space, um, this is what's often referred to as real space refinement. So, so perhaps in the tutorial, um, well, I'm sure in the tutorial, you'll, you'll do some real space refinement of your model into the map in Coot. Um, so a, another way of, of thinking about this refinement target, though, uh, comes a bit more from, from the world of X-ray crystallography. And so you can imagine from your model, instead of calculating uh, the expected density map, you could calculate what's essentially the, the simulated diffraction pattern uh, from that model, um, or structure factors, as, as we call them. Um, and it turns out that actually in the process of calculating your, your EM density map, you actually use um, reciprocal space, and, and so things that are analogous to structure factors are, are often called the Fourier coefficients. Um, so these, these are kind of equivalent, and so instead of, say, comparing our model to the experiment in real space in terms of maps, we can also compare our model to the experiment in this Fourier space or reciprocal space. Um, and so these are kind of just two different approaches to, to comparing your model with, with the experimental data. And so some refinement approaches use this, this real space approach, um, and other packages use this reciprocal space approach. And so historically in X-ray crystallography, reciprocal space refinement has, has dominated. Um, however, uh, you know, starting maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago or so, there, there's been uh, development of the usage of, of more and more real space refinement in X-ray crystallography as well. And so far, it seems like the real space approaches have kind of dominated the, the refinement protocols in prior year. OK. Um, so, so, so far, we've talked about only really comparing our model to, to the experimental data. And so what I'm showing you here is, is a model built into a very high resolution map from X-ray crystallography. Um, I, I forget the exact resolution. I think it's on the order of 0.7 angstroms or so resolution. And so you can see that, that in this structure, um, when we contour the map, uh, when we contour the map down, we can see that uh, there's density corresponding to the position of essentially every single heavy atom in the protein, right? So, so if we were to refine this model against only this experimental map, we'd expect to get something fairly sensible out at the end of the day, right? Because each of these atoms is going to be drawn to the center of each of these densities, right? So perhaps the you know precise bond lines might be you know, slightly off, but everything will look, you know, this tryptophan will look pretty much like a tryptophan at the end of the day. However, the maps that we're more often looking at in cryo uh, 
aren't quite so so featureful. Um, so so here's a map at you know a kind of typical near atomic resolution of maybe three and a half angstroms. And so you can see as we adjust the contour of the map, um, while it covers the, the backbone overall, and we see some density for side chains here and there, um, we uh, we don't have that same degree of detail, right? So, so the map is not telling us specifically the location of every single atom in the protein. It's just kind of globally telling us where the protein backbone is, and where there are likely to be side chains. And so if we were to try to refine the model using only the information from this map, we might see something like this. So this is just turning off all of the restraints and coops and, and refining a single residue. Um, so you can see that this phenylalanine collapses to just a spider web of, of atoms. Um, and so clearly we're going to need some additional information to, to keep the model together during the refinement process. So at a single residue level, you can see we need, we need restraints to keep, keep the residue um, looking like an amino acid. But also at the level of, of secondary structure and, and the protein as a whole. So here we can turn off the restraints and try to refine um, this whole alpha helix here at the center. You can see what happens when we do this. So we end up with a collapsed mess of atoms that are still roughly helical in shape because they're tracking with the, with the density map. Um, however, we've lost all of this known sort of stereochemical information that we, we expect based upon what, what we know about how a protein should look like. So the challenge in refinement is going to be how, how do we use this low in, low resolution information um, to, to refine models that look sensible at the end of the day. And I, actually, sorry, can I just ask real quick, so, so uh, when should I be aiming to finish up? Uh, you have a good half an hour. Half an hour. Okay, so 11.30, okay. All right, so um, so when we're refining protein structures, we have to be striking a balance um, between these two extremes, okay? So, so on the left, at one extreme, we have ex great density maps that tell us the location of every atom in the protein, um, and we can rely entirely on the map. And so this would be sort of unrestrained refinement using, using only our data. Uh, at the other extreme, over on the right, um, say you're at 50 angstroms resolution, um, that's not really going to tell you much of anything about the, the structure of your protein, maybe just its overall shape, right? And, and in the limit where you have absolutely no data, you're essentially just predicting the, pro the structure of the protein de novo. Of course, there's approaches to do this using software like Rosetta. But the vast majority of the time, we're, we're somewhere here in the middle where we have, we have some data that, that is useful to some degree, uh, but it's not really enough to specify what a protein should look like. Um, and we have also a lot of prior knowledge, and, and we can try to find a way to use some combination of the two of these things um, to make the best possible final model. And so we can add to that refinement target, so not just a comparison between our model and the experimental data, but we can, we can add in terms that include comparisons of our model with this prior knowledge. Um, and so you can imagine that depending upon where we are on this continuum, um, we may want to rely more heavily on either our prior knowledge or the experimental data. And so we can have weighting terms that, that determine how strongly we'll trust our data and how strongly we'll rely on that prior knowledge. Um, and so as I was listening in to, to Ollie's lecture via YouTube, um, I, I heard a bit of discussion about, about some of this prior knowledge, so we'll run through this um, kind of quickly. But um, so, so what are these sources of prior knowledge that we can incorporate into the refinement process? Um, so these can take uh, all sorts of forms. So for example, uh, bond lengths. So, so from high resolution crystal structures, we know how long a typical, say, uh, nitrogen carbon bond should be or how long carbon carbon bond should be. We have lots of information about what the angles between these, these bonds should be. Um, proteins, of course, are chiral molecules, so we know that um, each of these centers should have a particular uh, handedness, and we want to make sure we enforce that. And then we know that things like peptide bonds are planar, so, so this has some sort of double bond character. So first of all, we know that these four atoms should all be lying in a plane, actually more than four atoms. Um, and in addition, um, the rotation about this bond should be restricted, uh, and so that the, the torsion angle here should always probably be about 
close to either zero degrees or 180 degrees. Okay, um, and of course we also have information about rotation about bonds, and so even though we say many of these uh, bonds are, are freely rotatable, um, you may remember some of these sort of stick figures from your OCHEM classes, um, and so while, while we may be able to rotate semi-freely around this bond, um, there's definitely going to be some preferred conformations, um, and so uh, those preferred conformations will minimize um, putting bulky, bulky groups in close proximity, as you see up here on the top. Um, and it will favor conformations where those bulky groups are put um, kind of trans from each other. Okay, and so all of this weighs into to kind of a series of restraints we can apply to, to the backbone and side chains to, to try to keep our models looking sensible. Um, another layer of this that gets increasingly important at low resolution is, is restraints on secondary structure and hydrogen bonding. So we know what alpha helices should look like. We know um, what in which residue should be, sorry, which atoms of which residue should be hydrogen bonding with uh, their neighbors. Um, and so we can build up um, restraints based upon uh, this, these known secondary structure elements like helices and, and beta strands. Um, and, and these can take two different flavors. So, um, so we can have restraints that are based upon hydrogen bonding. So we can essentially be attaching little rubber bands like these dashed lines here that just kind of keep hydrogen bonding adding atoms um, in close proximity to each other. Um, these can also be applied in the absence of secondary structure, of course, so these could be used to enforce hydrogen bonding um, outside of regular structure. Um, and these restraints can also take the form of, of torsion angle restraints. So, so we know that the, the conformation of the backbone uh, in an alpha helix is going to be preferred uh, torsion angles at the rotatable bonds, um, and so we can instead um, restrain those torsion angles to, to the alpha helical part of the Ramachandra plot or, or the, the beta, beta strand region. Um, another kind of restraint we can apply has you know, historically been called non-crystal graphic symmetry because, because it originates in crystallography. Um, but you frequently especially because we're often solving the structures of large complexes using EM, we'll often have multiple copies of, of um, presumably identical subunits uh, within your, your large complex. And so what I'm showing here on the left are just two copies of an enzyme active site from, from a particular crystal structure. And you can see that, you know, as you'd expect, if you have two copies of essentially the same protein in, in your overall structure, um, you'll expect there to be a high degree of similarity between corresponding regions. And so, so here we can see in these two copies of the active site, the way the waters are coordinated are essentially the same. Um, the way all the side chains are positioned are essentially the same. And so we can, we can assume, and it, and it makes a lot of sense, especially at lower resolution, to assume that all of your uh, copies of the protein that have the same sequence are going to have essentially the identical structure. Um, and so, so we can we can draw on this and say, all right, well, so um, protein one and protein two have the same sequence, and so we're going to force these to be either exactly the same or very similar to each other. And so, when we force them to be similar to each other but not identical, we call these NCS restraints. Um, and when we force them to be absolutely identical, um, we call these constraints. And so currently um, in, in Phoenix Refine, actually, I think you are only able to, to constrain chains to be completely identical. Um, but I, the refinement software is rapidly evolving, and so you may be looking out in the future for, for other options that might allow you to, to have some more flexibility here. Okay, so these active sites look very similar to each other, um, but where this tends to benefit you the most is, is at lower resolution, but the kind of resolutions we're typically at with the uh, and so even though, um, you know, so this is a high resolution structure we're looking at here, but even though, um, uh, so, so we, you know, we expect these, these two active sites to be very similar. However, your map might not be identical in, in all locations, so like all copies of this particular chain. Um, you know, so often, you know, we may apply symmetry to the map um, such that the map in all locations may be the same, but there are some situations where this may not be the case. Uh, perhaps you have some symmetry mismatch in your molecules. You have a hexameric subunit interacting with a dimeric subunit, and you might only be able to apply two-fold symmetry overall to the map. Um, 
but you have these, these six copies of a protein you want to, to force to be identical or similar. Um, so this can be really beneficial in those sorts of situations. And in that kind of situation, your map won't be the same in, in all six of those copies of your subunit. And so even here, you can see it at high resolution in this red box, there's some additional density in the one active site that's not present in the other active site. Here's another little blip that's there's a little bit of extra density here at the bottom that's not present at the top. And so this extra density sometimes can indicate that there are real differences, but particularly at low resolution, it may well just be noise. Maybe we see good density for a particular side chain in the first copy of our protein, uh, but we don't see it so clearly in the second copy, right? But so to a first assumption, it probably makes sense to assume that those side chains are the same. And so, so we can kind of you draw on the information we get from, from each of the pseudo-identical sites in, in the structure we're working on um, to try to build the most accurate model we possibly can. Okay, and so um, so one other detail of this is that um, so we we can use these sort of restraints um, when we have multiple copies of an identical chain um, within the structure we're working on, but we can also um, use restraints based upon a homologous structure, perhaps solved at higher resolution. Um, that's not actually present in, in the structure we're trying to solve, but, but something we can just kind of restrain our current model to. So, so for example, um, maybe someone has solved a, a two angstrom crystal structure of a protein that's 90% identical to one of the subunits from your large complex um, that you are now working on at four angstrom's resolution, right? So, so we can say, well, the structure I'm working on now should be very similar to that two angstrom crystal structure. So I'm going to restrain the conformation of, of my subunit to resemble that crystal structure. Okay, um, so another form of restraints uh, acts at the level of the B factors, um, or so ADPs refer to atomic displacement parameters. These, these two things are synonymous. Um, and so this is based upon the idea, so here I'm showing you um, a, a snippet of a protein that's um, color-coded by, by B factor, um, and also the size of the ribbon changes with the B factor. So where where the protein is most flexible and the P factors are highest, um, the colors are warmer and also the ribbon is fatter. And so what you can see looking at this is that um, the distribution of B factors across the protein is not random, right? So um, if you find a residue that's blue and therefore has a low B factor, its neighbors tend to also be blue. And if you look at a region where um, the protein is yellow and therefore has somewhat elevated B factors, the neighboring residues all tend to be yellowish as well, right? So this tells us that, you know, so, so the B factor of a given residue is not completely random. So it's actually fairly well correlated with its neighbor. And so, so if you had to guess the B factor of a neighboring residue, um, taking, you know, the, the so taking the B factor of this residue, if you had to guess, it's probably gonna be very similar to the B factor of this residue and the residue on the other side as well. And so we can we can actually take this information as a sort as a form of restraint against the refinement of those B factors um, and say that, okay, well, I'm not gonna allow the neighboring B factors to, to differ from this residue by more than, than some amount. Okay. And this makes a lot of sense because you know you can imagine that. Um, the residues within this helix are probably undergoing similar sorts of vibrations and emotions. Um, and, and so it's unlikely that say one residue in the middle of the helix is gonna have an extremely high mobility and its neighbors will not, right? Yeah, so then we can, we can restrain the effect of a given residue to be similar to its neighbors. And that also helps us to kind of refine our models a bit better. Um, I showed you this, this little movie earlier of you know refining this phenylalanine residue without any restraints. So one of the problems here is that um, you know even though we know that that two atoms you know they, they kind of want the, the closest they should really come together for the most part if they're not covalently bonded is sort of the sum of their van der Waals radii. Um, in this case here, right, so, so all of these atoms essentially end up on top of each other. And you can imagine that one way we could try to prevent this from happening would be to say that we're not going to allow any overlap between, between the atoms. 
And so this is actually something that has been uh, widely used in refinement packages for a while. So, so basically, we'll, we won't allow atoms to, to overlap like this, or, or we'll make, a, make the refinement pay a penalty if we allow the atoms to overlap. And so we can, we can have some, some potential that tries to force the atoms apart if they start to overlap. And then uh, uh, I think an exciting new development in this area, so, so to some extent, preventing these atoms from overlapping and having this sort of repulsive term of the refinement target um, is, is essentially a very simple force field, right? Um, but until very recently, for the most part, these force fields used in refinement were predominantly um, repulsive in nature, right? So, so if two atoms uh, came too close together, we would try to push them back apart. Um, however, very recently, um, many refinement software packages have started to try to incorporate attractive terms because um, so, so there's been a tendency to only having these repulsive terms to, to kind of push things apart and, and the, the packing of the core of the protein, for example, would be a little looser than it probably um, really should be in reality because we have all these forces that are kind of pulling the protein apart, but nothing that's really pulling it together. Um, and so, so recently, uh, well, so, so a few years ago, for example, uh, uh, about 2016, so, so Rosetta um, developed some refinement protocols that could be used with, with EM structures. And so this draws on some sort of, um, uh, I don't know, how do I say? So, so, so a force field is not necessarily based upon sort of uh, attractive, attractive bonding parameters, but, but what we can sort of glean from, from large data sets and what we know about protein structure. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry, but so, uh, yeah, I'm getting off track, I guess. Um, so uh, so these, these force fields have been long used in, in other areas outside of X-ray and EM structure refinement. And so um, actually, probably mostly in, in the context of NMR structure determination and, and molecular dynamics. And so, so you know, with, with NMR structures, uh, we, we derive some restraints from the data, but, but, you know, we really need additional information there as well to help create a really nicely folded, well-defined protein uh, structure. And so um, the AMBER software package has been used for a long time to help guide uh, the, the sort of in silico folding of, of NMR structures based upon the, the NMR-derived restraints. Um, and it's essentially a, a molecular dynamics package. So now these sorts of approaches are being applied uh, more and more to, to the refinement of, of X-ray and EM structures. So I mentioned the, the Rosetta energy function. Um, and then just very recently in the most recent version of Phoenix, um, they're now incorporating this amber force field that's long been used in, in NMR structure calculations um, into the refinement of both X-ray and EM structures. So I actually haven't really had a chance to play with this much because it's a relatively new development. Um, but I was checking just before as I was putting this lecture together and it has now made its way into the, the Phoenix Real Space Refined module that's kind of the most widely used software package uh, for EM refinement. So, so definitely that's something, uh, of an area of active development and something you probably want to play with as you start working to refine your own models. Okay, so we started off with this sort of picture of how we might um, develop that uh, target function for the refinement of our structure. So we're going to compare our model to the experimental data. Um, but you can see that actually this refinement target is actually a lot more complicated. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and so, so we actually, during the refinement process, um, our refinement software is comparing our model not only to the data, but to all of these other sources of, of prior knowledge. And by um, using the combination of these, we hope to arrive at, at the most sensible model we can. And so that refinement target then takes the form of this much uh, longer expression with, with multiple terms corresponding to, to each of these different kinds of prior knowledge. And we can uh, potentially assign different weights to each of these uh, or sort of a global weight that, that tries to take into account all of these. Okay, so, so th this is kind of the, the basis for how all of these refinement packages work. Um, and so the kind of more practical question is maybe which one should you use, right? And um, 
I, I think the answer is, is you should probably try all of them and you should probably keep trying all of them every few months uh, because the field is rapidly changing and I think people are still kind of trying to figure out what of the which of the tools from x-ray refinement will be helpful which things won't work so well for em refinement and what completely new things can we try that uh, maybe haven't been tried before um, i did take a, a sort of poll of the pdb to try to get a sense of of what what most people are using um, and so of the, the structures in the pdb when i did this a couple days ago um, there are about 4,000 structures, give or take. Uh, about 30% of those reported using Phoenix for refinement. Um, about 4% uh, said they used RefMac. Um, I, I couldn't find any that said they used Rosetta, although I know that many people use this. Um, so it, it might just be that it is not getting captured well in the deposition process. Um, so over about two thirds though, didn't specify the refinement software that they used. Um, and this is, this is a little bit of a problem, and so I would just like to, to say at this point that like you don't want to be this person who doesn't give credit to the developers who have put a lot of work into making this software. So when you deposit your, your beautiful structure after you've used Phoenix or RefMac or Rosetta, make sure you give credit to, to the people that are working hard to develop this software. Um, so just to kind of try to get a sense of what might be hiding in this 66% that didn't say what software they used. Um, I, I picked 10, 10 structures randomly from here and, and went through the paper to try to figure out what software they used. And of those, it seemed like about uh, six of the 10 used Phoenix. So Phoenix is definitely uh, by far the most, most widely used. Um, one of them used RefMac, one used Rosetta. What was the rest of this? So one seemed to have only used Chimera, which um, you know, Chimera is great for fitting and, and, uh, and modeling, uh, but it was this was a high resolution, maybe two angstrom, two and a half angstrom structure. So, um, I imagine they must have used something else, and, and perhaps that didn't make it their methods. Um, and finally, there was one that I still still couldn't figure out what they used. So, so anyway, so so this is kind of the the flavor of, of the packages that are out there. Um, so definitely. Um, I would give Phoenix a try. I would give RefMac a try. Uh, definitely try to give Rosetta a try. It's a little more um, complicated software package to use, but, if, but I think it's very powerful. So um, just a brief comparison of, of those three packages. Um, so um, both Phoenix and Rosetta operate in the real space, um, so directly kind of map-to-map -map comparison. Um, RefMac originated with X-ray crystallography and actually still uses a, a reciprocal space refinement target. Um, and actually, I guess in the interest of time, I think uh, I'll move on. But but there's a, li a little bit of detail here. You can look back at. Okay, so so refinement. Um, so we we now understand our refinement target. How do we drive our structure down towards towards the global minimum um, where we get the best agreement between between our model and data. So there's, there's many different um, refinement and optimization protocols that you can use. Um, the simplest, perhaps, is, is just rigid body refinement. And so many of you have probably done this sort of thing in, in Chimera or, or Coot. Um, and so here you can very clearly see the, the density for these helices, um, but they're just sort of displaced by, by a few angstroms. Um, and so rigid body refinement just allows us to, to, through small rotations and translations of the molecule, um, try to, to move these secondary structural elements into their, their position at the map. And so particularly when you're just starting off the refinement of a new structure, this would be one of the first things you want to do, just to make sure that globally your, your uh, starting model is positioned in the map as, as best as you can. Once you've got the model positioned in the map, then there's a many, many different refinement protocols you can try to use. Um, the, the sort of simplest is just a, a sort of gradient-based minimization. Um, and so you, you can think of uh, your starting point as this sort of red sphere up here. And, and um, these sorts of refinements generally just drive your model towards the closest local minimum. And so you can imagine if you, if you have an atom that's in the density but not quite centered in the density, this will just move the atom towards the closest um, maximum in the density, right? So, so where the density is strongest. 
Um, however, if your global minimum is all the way over here, um, these gradient-driven minimization routines tend to just get you down to the bottom of the nearest local minimum. And so we need other sorts of approaches to be able to get us from here all the way over to our target over here. And so the challenge here is that, that this sort of direct minimization has a very small radius of convergence. And, and so that just means that, that from the starting point, you tend to just go to the, the closest local minimum. Um, and so we need other sorts of refinement protocols that have a larger radius of convergence that can get us over these, these sort of um, energetic barriers. So what, what sort of approaches can we take? Um, so one of the, the oldest and most widely applied is uh, simulated annealing. And so um, this is a bit of a fuzzy movie. I don't know how the movies are coming through. But, um, but essentially, this, is, this involves just, just simulating the, the heating up of your, your molecule such that um, any sort of flexible regions can sample alternate conformations, loops can shift position. Um, and then we, we cool in silico the protein back down and allow it to relax into, uh, into the map uh, and find a, a new low minimum. And if we do this multiple times, and so what we're seeing here is multiple cycles of, of simulated annealing, the hope is that we'll eventually work our way through a series of local minima um, and hopefully find our way to, to the global minima. And so you can imagine here, so we do some uh, initial uh, minimization, then we heat our molecule up, and it can either go back up the way it came or it can hop over this barrier to the right and down to the next local minimum. Each cycle of simulated annealing, hopefully we drive our molecule over these barriers and closer and closer to, to the global minimum, the best possible agreement between our model and our data. Um, some other approaches to, to, um, to refinement that, that have a wider radius of convergence. Um, so, so, so torsion angle grid searches uh, effectively just sample all possible um, rhodomeric states uh, for side chains, and you can also do this for the backbone. So um, in the simplest case, you can imagine we're looking at the Syrian residue here. Um, it has three preferred rhodomeric states, um, so one going to the left, one going to the right, and one kind of coming out towards us. Um, as the side chain gets longer and longer, um, this gets more and more complicated with a, another dimension for each of the rotatable bonds. And so for something like this isoleucine, which is still relatively simple, um, so we have three rotomers about the C alpha C beta bond, uh, but we also, uh, in each of those conformations, can, can rotate um, this final uh, methyl group about this rotatable bond here. And so we have one that's pointing backwards, one that's pointing upwards. And so um, we can try all combinations of these. Some will be disallowed for steric reasons, but these allow us to move the side chains uh, over larger distances than, than would be possible just by minimization alone. And so um, the idea here is that um, we can create models with all different uh, possible conformations to using this grid search um, and then refine each of these and, and this may allow us to sort of jump over some of these uh, local maxima, and, and then we can take the, the model that ultimately gets us to the, uh, the best agreement with our data. Uh, another, another approach implemented in Phoenix is, is called morphing. Um, and so the idea here is that, you know, your starting model may agree reasonably well with the map, but there may be regions like flexible loops that uh, adopt a different conformation in, in, uh, in your structure compared to whatever your start, starting model was. And so it's, it's a little bit messy here, but, but it, we can kind of trace through maybe the cyan model, and so roughly that, that's where that backbone is. Uh, but we see that this density is down here, and that's probably actually where this loop should, should be going. So, so that's what I'm highlighting here, yellow. And so you can imagine trying to take segments of the backbone that you could move as sort of rigid bodies. Um, and so perhaps we could take this chunk of the loop and translate it as a rigid body down here to where the yellow trace is. So if we do that, and then subsequent rounds of refinement, um, we can ultimately shift the position of a whole loop over uh, a, pretty re a pretty large distance. Um, and then the final resulting map um, looked quite nice. 
Okay, so what does this all look like in practice? Um, so just have a couple of snapshots from, from the Phoenix Refine GUI. Um, so uh, you, know, you can put in all your input information, but here are all of these different refinement protocols we've been talking about, right? So you can, you can do morphing, you can do grid search, simulated annealing. I mean, so at different stages of refinement, you'll want to, to use different different options here. So at, at the beginning, you know, I said we probably want to start with rigid body refinement. Um, in the next few rounds after that, you might want to use some of the more aggressive refinement protocols that, that have a larger uh, radius of convergence, such as morphing, simulated annealing, and grid search. And then in the later stages where you're sort of fine tuning your model, you probably don't want to allow the refinement software to make such big changes anymore. And so you may, in your final few rounds of refinement, just settle for something like this uh, minimization and, and de facto refinement. Um, you can try different confirmations of restraints as well, like some of those things we talked about towards the beginning. Um, so restraining secondary structure or not, using non crystallographic symmetry or not, or that sort of similar thing, reference model restraints. Um, so all of, all of these things we discussed are, are here in the GUI. Ultimately, you get, you get all your files out, um, and you'll get all of these statistics out that describe uh, the quality of your final model. And so, um, so that really kind of transitions us to to the uh, validation stage, which, so so did you say 11.30? Uh, you can actually have 15 more minutes. How much more time do I have? You're, it's actually 11.45. Till 11.45? Correct. Okay, all right. That's probably just about enough time. Okay, so, um, so in addition to uh, a refined model, we, Phoenix will tell us all of these statistics about, about the quality of our model. Um, and so what, what do all of these things mean? So we're going to run through some of these key key aspects of the validation process uh, quickly here, and I may I can choose a little bit. Um, so the goal of validation at the end of the day um, is to, there are several goals. So we want to um, assess how our refinement is doing. So, so based upon these statistics, we can make decisions about whether we're using good refinement protocols or not. Um, we want to identify parts of our model that are particularly problematic where we may need to, to manually intervene to, to rebuild. Um, and then from a more consumer perspective, um, we want to be able to say if we download a new model from the PDB solved by someone else, how can we quickly assess the overall quality of their model and whether there are particular parts of their model that, that seem to have problems. Okay, so um, so these are some of the key metrics that I think uh, are important to consider when you're, you're thinking about validation. So so here they're grouped by by sort of what the underlying problem they may help you diagnose are. And so there are some uh, quality indicators that kind of reflect the model overall. So for example, how well your model agrees with your map. So it's a model map correlation coefficient. Um, root mean square deviations of, of your bond lengths and bond angles relative to, to our expectations from high resolution structures. Um, are there any unmodeled densities uh, where you still need to try to fit in parts of your model? Uh, Molprobity uh, is a, a suite for, for validation that includes all sorts of metrics. We'll look briefly at that. Um, and then there are some more kind of specific areas. So for example, if there's problems with your backbone, these tend to show up in your Ramachandran plot um, or in the presence, for example, of, of cis-peptide bonds. Um, Sidechain issues, these often pop up um, in, in uh, metrics that are looking at rotomer outliers. Um, and, and one program you might want to try tinkering with is something called EM Ringer um, that, that tells you how well your rotomers agree with your um, experimental density map. C beta deviations, they also tell us something about side chain issues as well as sometimes backbone issues. Um, and then also we want to be looking at our B factor refinement and see if we have any, any outliers, which might tell us something about um, models we've, uh, areas we've modeled into very weak electron density, uh, or sorry, uh, EM density. Okay. Um, these different metrics can also give us some hint as to where the problem is coming from. 
Um, and so, you know, some of the sources of problems with our model can come from uh, the model building we've done ourselves um, in Kube, for example. Um, some of the problems may come from the way we're doing the refinement. So perhaps we, you know, our restraints are too tight or too loose. Um, and, and some of these can be diagnostic of both. And so, um, so I'll, I won't go into the detail here again, but uh, you can look back at this as a guide. Okay, so, so the first of those statistics I mentioned is this, this model versus map correlation coefficient. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so one of the, the challenges I would say in, in refining a PM structure is um, for, for many people coming from crystallography, we've often relied on things like our work and our free as a measure of how well our model agrees with, with our data. Um, and so the model map correlation coefficients is kind of the closest thing we have to this in EM. Um, and so there, there are a few different flavors of this. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into each of these. But probably most commonly, you'll see either CC mask or CC volume. Um, these are essentially a measure of how well your model agrees with your experimental density map. Um, and so uh, they vary from zero to one. And so one would mean that um, your model perfectly explains the, the map. Zero would mean it doesn't explain the map at all. So I guess that would mean you don't have a model at all. Uh, and, and typically, you know, when you're done with refinement, depending on your resolution, these may be somewhere between 0.6 or 0.8, maybe a little higher, a little lower. Um, but that, that kind of gives you a rough idea of, of what you might be shooting for. So if your uh, CC values are way outside of this, that might tell you either you have more work to do in terms of model building or, or that um, uh, that the model you built just is not very well explaining the, the experimental data. The root mean square deviations tell us uh, how well our, our bond lengths and bond angles are agreeing with, with what we know protein should look like. Um, so typical values for these RMS bonds and RMS angles are, are these figures I'm giving you here. Um, for the most part, if your values are way outside of these ranges, that tends to mean uh, that there's something wrong with how you're doing the refinement. Uh, because these, these are sort of values that take into account all the bond lengths of your entire protein. And so, so unlikely to be perturbed significantly by, by a small local region that is you know, not quite built properly. Um, and so it tends to be that they will go, they will get very large if, um, if during refinement your restraints are not tight enough. So that would be something to check. We saw that these were much larger than expectation. Um, so these values are written out in the, in the header of your PDB file, for example, and all the log files you would get from whatever software package you use. So you can just kind of check and make sure that they, they seem like they're in line with expectation. Uh, in terms of areas of the of your map that, that still need to be modeled. Um, you, of course, can drag your model and map all around and look for areas where you see density but no model. Uh, but CUDE has a lot of great validation tools here. And um, Ali may run through some of these in the tutorial later, I'm not sure. But, um, but one that's really great for this sort of thing is this unmodeled blobs option. Um, and so you can basically ask CUDE to, to look for any regions of the map that uh, where you see it seem to have strong density, but no model built there. Um, and so once you do this, you'll get this list of blobs that you can just click on and cycle through. Um, and you can then try to see if it looks like noise, if it looks like it could be protein. Um, so in this case, you know, this density looks roughly helical to me. Um, and so probably there's you know, a turn or two of a helix that we could fit into the map there. Uh, and then we could kind of try to see if we can connect it to anything nearby. If we can't connect it to anything nearby, you know, maybe we model it as a, an unknown layout. Um, so we just have to see. But you can work your way through this list of, of unknown blobs and try to make as complete a model as you can. Mobility uh, does uh, a lot of analysis. Um, it's really great. I actually, so, so Phoenix and a lot of the refinement packages will run uh, more property for you automatically. And so a lot of these stats are in that initial output that comes from Phoenix. Um, I actually like to run it through the more property website and I'll have the URL at the end of these lecture notes. Um, I like that because actually 
on their website um, for a couple of these key statistics. They'll actually give you a percentile for how your model compares to um, other models in the PUD. And so, for example, the class clash score, which tells us about how many atomic overlaps we have distributed through our model. Um, you can see for this particular protein, um, compared to uh, a bunch of other EM structures, um, we're at the 96th percentile, right? So that tells us that um, we're doing, you know, a lot better than average. Um, and so I, I like that sort of more um, relative metric as well, just, just to let us know, like, how we're doing to, to a bunch of other structures. Ramachandran plot is, is a really classic way to try to diagnose backbone problems. This is also very conveniently there in CUD for you. Um, so you can uh, go to this validation menu, Ramachandran plot, and select the model of interest, and it will um, create this interactive Ramachandran plot that allows you to immediately zero in on residues that have backbone issues. And so uh, in blue here are residues that are in allowed regions of the Ramachandran plot. Um, in red are residues that are outliers. Um, and so based upon the shape is determined by the residue identity. So these triangles are glycines, the squares I think are prolines, and all the round ones are all the other non-glycine, non-proline residues. And so, so you can actually just click on any one of these um, and it'll take you to that part of that residue in the model and you can immediately look at, um, look at the problematic residue and try to diagnose what, what might be going wrong there. Um, and depending upon which type of residue, so I mentioned that, so for example, the triangles are glycines. So if you mouse over a glycine residue, it will adjust the Ramachandran plot to show you the regions that are um, preferred in this kind of orangish, peachish color, uh, regions that are preferred for glycine and also allowed for glycine in this kind of yellow gray. But that's different for glycine than it is for proline and it's different than it would be for, for all other amino acids. So this is nice because um, you can really kind of look at the specific residue type um, that you're focused on um, and it allows you to be kind of more, more precise in, in how you deal with these, these backbone outliers. Um, so so that you can go through your Ramachandran plot and try to correct any of those red residues that were you know, originally flagged here and hopefully by the end you have rummish on plots that look like this where you have no red residues and everything falls within the preferred regions or, or the allowed regions. Uh, just very briefly, almost all the peptide bonds in your protein should be trans. Um, it's extremely rare to have a cis peptide bond that's not associated with the proline or sometimes the glycine. And this is because in the cis conformation of the, the um, peptide bond, this brings the side chain in close proximity um, between the two adjacent residues and, and leads to clashes. And so Coot has now um, developed some great tools so that this is just immediately visualized for you there um, as you're building your model. So um, if you have a cis peptide bond, it will be flagged. Um, and so if it's associated with a proline residue, it's uh, prolines, like I said, are one of the only residues that is commonly associated with a cis peptide bond. So in this case, this little wedge here will be colored green, indicating there's a cis peptide bond, but it's probably okay because there's a proline. Um, however, in other situations, if you have a cis peptide bond where there's not a proline, um, this will be flagged as red. So just as you're working your way through your model, checking that you're fitting your model to your map, you should see these regions and it should be able to clue you in that there may be something wrong with the backbone here. And then in yellow, Coot now color codes um, anything that has a distorted peptide bond. So, so we know that peptide bonds should either be cis or trans. Very rarely should they be anywhere in between because, because of the double bond character of peptide bond. So, um, so these yellow regions uh, reflect twisted peptide bonds that are not at zero degrees, not at 180 degrees, but somewhere kind of halfway in between. And that also uh, suggests there's something wrong with the backbone also indicated by the fact that there's many yellow blobs in this area. And so here's just a, a kind of more detailed example of that. So, so here, Coot is indicating a cis peptide bond that's not associated with a proline residue. Um, and you can see that, you know, it, it fits reasonably well to the map, but you can reposition the backbone to make, make this now a trans peptide bond. It fits the map quite well. Um, and we've relieved this, this sort of unexpected, uncommon cis peptide bond. 
Um, all sorts of validation tools. Um, you should check out all of these. Um, one of the favorites of the people in my lab is this Rotomer analysis tool. And so um, it'll give you these plots along the entire length of each chain of your protein, telling you where there's potentially problems with um, the conformations of your side chains. So in red, it'll color code anything that is um, an outlier in terms of its rhodomeric state. Um, it's also kind of convenient. Uh, it will color code any side chain that is missing atoms, this sort of lilac or, or purple color. Um, and that's sometimes helpful because maybe maybe early on in refinement, you cut off some side chains that you can't really very clearly see where they fit. Uh, but this kind of reminds you to come back and have a look at them later on and see if you can figure out where, where you put them at. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to mention EM Ringer. I would definitely check this out, and the, the references for EM Ringer are down here. So, so this, rather than looking so much at, at um, geometry violations, EM Ringer tries to assess how well um, the different rhodomeric states of your side chain fit to the observed uh, EM density. And so, um, it can make these plots where you can see how um, how the strength of the electron density corresponds to the different preferred rhodomeric states, uh, and it can suggest we, um, it can suggest rhodomer flips um, for side chains that don't agree as well with the density map, and also can give you some sort of validation statistics for overall how well your model agrees with your side chains agree with, with your density map. I think, let me just double check. Yeah, so, um, so I think kind of the final validation metric I'd just like to touch on are these things called C beta deviations, which I think for, for many people when they're first getting started are very mysterious. Um, and so what the heck is a C beta deviation? Well, so B, C beta deviations are really helpful in helping to diagnose um, problems with side chain conformation, often coupled with problems with the positioning of the backbone. And so what you're seeing here in this movie, hopefully, um, is two different possible ways to model a leucine side chain into this density here. And so one is right and one is wrong. And so you should kind of think to yourself what your best guess is, because we'll tell you the answer in a minute. Um, but, uh, but looking at C beta deviations often can help us to diagnose this sort of problem and help us to figure out which of these rotomers is the correct one and which of them is incorrect. So when I say C beta deviation, what am I talking about? So, um, so if we look at, at a given amino acid here in the protein, um, so we have the C alpha residue, and then the first residue of the side chain is the C beta atom. And so if we were to look down that bond, so from the C beta towards the C alpha, that's the view we're looking at here at the right. And so the expectation is that, you know, that C beta atom should be right at the center of this plot here. However, due to you know um, small amounts of strain or, or uh, small conformational differences in the protein, this won't always be perfectly exactly at the center. And so you see that there's this kind of cloud of when we look at high resolution structures, there's this cloud of possible C beta positions. Uh, but the vast majority of those C beta positions in high resolution structures um, falls within this this radius here. Um, and so we can, we can set that radius as a cutoff and assume that anything inside there is well modeled and anything that is outside of that um, is potentially a, a rotor outlier. And so when we do this, we can see that, that actually a, a large number of residues in, in a particular protein structure may fall outside that region and are areas we might want to look at a little more carefully. And so this, this leucine rotomer issue is, is the kind of situation that might show up um, with a large C beta deviation value. That's because we're kind of trying to force a side chain into a density in a way that it doesn't want to fit. And so coming back to this here, so the yellow one is actually the correct way to fit this rotomer. And the magenta one is the one that would potentially show up as, as a C beta outlier. Just looking at the model in the map, unless you have a lot of experience, you might not necessarily notice which one of these is correct. And so C beta deviations are really helpful in trying to clue you into these problem areas. Okay, so um, with that, I've told you about pretty much everything I wanted to tell you about. Um, so I'll just end uh, on my final slide here. I have some, some uh, references that I think uh, would be really great reading uh, as you're getting started in 
defining EM structures, and also some links to some validation and, and refinement packages. So thanks. I don't know if we can do this. If, I might have to repeat a question or two, but were there any questions for Damien? So I have a question for you, Damien, if you're still on the line. Yep. Like with writing, you can keep on editing and editing. Up to what point do you feel that you're, you've done your best you could for your model? What criteria do you do before you stop and move on? Uh, yes. Uh, I think I think it's always hard to know, but um, I I mean I, I think I, I tend to keep going until I feel like I fixed everything that I can possibly fix, um, and it, um, it it's hard to know when to stop, and especially with larger structures, it gets to be hard to know um, you know exactly where that line is. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that you know often we're interested in some particular part of our structure, you know, um, the new subunit, and we want to really we're really interested in the interaction between that new subunit and the rest of a complex that we solved previously. But we never know what someone else might be interested in, and so I think um, you know sometimes people will really just focus on the active side, and they'll see that there's all sorts of errors elsewhere in the protein. I think it's important to try to try to make the best model you possibly can. Um, so, and that I guess largely focuses on trying to resolve um, these sort of geometric outliers for the most part. Um, you know, you, you go through the model end to end multiple times, making sure visually that things uh, fit with the map as best as you can, um, and then um, and then just try to make sure that geometrically it, it makes sense. Um, there will always be outliers, so at some point I think you have to decide. Um, you know, like I'm looking at this, I see it's flagged as an outlier, the density is garbage, I, I don't know what to do with it, and, and you will be left in those situations, and you, so you have to accept a certain degree of um, uncertainty, and, and you know, no model will be perfect, but um, just want to fix as much as you can, I guess. But I think there's no no one metric that you know you can really rely on. Though I suppose one maybe maybe a better answer to this question and the shorter answer to this question is, um, you know, more probability, for example, actually gives a lot of guidelines um, for targets. So, for example, um, they they advise you to shoot for ninety eight percent in the um, preferred parts of the Ramachandran plot. I think less than 02 percent. Um, Ramachandran outlier. So, so there are some um, guidelines that a lot of these validation programs will give to you. It's hard. It's hard to meet all of them, I would say, um, but it gives you some sense for each metric what you should be shooting for. Okay. okay. One last question: As you're going through the database and looking at the annotation, are there any things that you wish were there that haven't been standards? Hmm. Well, um, you know, that's something, yeah, that's also evolving. So so the PDB, I think, is still, um, so, so I actually was just exchanging a message with someone at the PDB recently, because, um, you know, searching by EM resolution is not something that's um, very easy to do at this point. Um, and so a lot of the metrics, like new metrics, are not being captured. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say, like, you know, in the statistics tables that are in the papers is, is where there's maybe more room for individuals to um, try to try to be as thorough as possible. And so, you know, if, if you're not in an EM lab, you know, I, I would say as you're preparing your manuscript, grab grab a manuscript from from an EM heavy lab, you know, Yifan Cheng's lab, for example, and, and look at what what stats they're putting in their table, um, because the standards aren't really well established, I think, at this point, and and they're changing as people are coming up with with new metrics. Um, so, uh, at this point, I would just put in everything, and then we can worry about what's non essential later. Okay. I think we'll wrap up here. Let's thank Damien one more time. Hopefully, we can hear the applause. Yeah, That's thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And, and sorry, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Okay. So we'll take a break here, and we'll move back downstairs.
Ollie has some instructions for the tutorial. It's actually online, if you can see that PDF. And we'll try to also form in pairs, because I know a lot of people have Windows computers, so it works the best, I think, in Mac? Mac or Linux is fine. Mac or Linux. Okay, and we'll have a working lunch. We'll, we'll be eating pizza as we try to learn how to model build with Coot. We can, we can try with Windows, it's just that the, the latest version of Coot is not available. Okay.